Yeah, baby. You know it's all about NTA. Here we go. Somebody say NTA, NTA, NTA. The next thing that bothers me in Trinidad and Tobago is the situation with crime. It's almost like you're living in a jail cell without the bars. Everybody, you, you have sons and daughters who you, you know, may want to go do a job and they stay out late. The first thing you have to do is call them. Are you coming home? Are you, are you safe? Uh, you know, are you able to get a taxi? That is a problem. Our next speaker has been at the height of dealing with crime in Trinidad and Tobago. And he has, by far, hands down, done one of the best jobs that Trinidad and Tobago has ever seen as a Minister of National Security. And he's also former Commissioner of Police. Please welcome to the podium, Mr. Gary Griffith. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. To members of the head table, members of the governance team, members of the empowerment committees, to my wife, Nicole Dyer Griffith. Special good evening to my mother-in-law. You know, once you're close to your mother-in-law, you're in. Huh? The in-laws must never be the outlaws. So good evening to my mother-in-law. I'm here today, and it's very interesting that being here this evening, people may not be aware that we are here in Surrey, in Lopino. I lived in Surrey for over a year. I love Surrey. It's a lovely place. But I was sorry in England. <laughs> I just had to. I just had to throw that one. So it's another type of sorry. I was. So I was sorry for not living in this sorry. In that other sorry, I was doing knuckle push-ups and running around in forested areas for 20 miles and all that. That's when I was in the military academy in Sandhurst. I was San, sorry in Sandhurst. And coming up here, it reminds me so much of when you're looking at this country. What a lovely country this is. And it's a lovely country with lovely people. And what has affected our country? politics and politicians. So for persons who are here today and they expect what you're gonna see is a political leader with his head popping up and down, attacking people, people making questions and calling other persons names to make themselves feel comfortable, attacking, discrediting, destroying, undermining, wrong political party, wrong meeting. I am not here to try to divide as a political leader, as a politician. I'm here to unite. I'm not here to destroy, I'm here to build. I'm not here to be destructive, I'm here to be productive. And I ask all of you all who are in this political party, please let us try to understand that. The importance of what I am, I've come back into politics is to unite Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, I was gonna rush them, like I know somebody was going to applaud them. <laughs> The, and the reason we need to unite Trinidad and Tobago is because it is the same politicians that have destroyed Trinidad and Tobago, this lovely country. And again, going back to this lovely place here, that where we are, the politicians have divided it. When you listen to the hatred, the bitterness, the anger, people go and listen to political meetings to hear the bacchanal, to hear about the mark being bus, to hear you saying the nastiest things about person and then everybody laughing, gip, 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 gip. That can't be right. And the country has been divided. And when we look at DC, I mean, this is not in any way to discredit the two other political parties. They have been good political parties and they have done a lot for this country. People will make mistakes. I would make mistakes. I would continue to make mistakes. But what I do, the difference with myself, is to try to make sure I have a proper team around me. Anytime you're a, you're a political leader and all you want is yes people around you, that is when you will make mistakes. And we have seen it for so long in this country because those persons are wrong the political leader. Test them. Those persons are wrong that political leader. They are afraid to say the truth, afraid to say what needs to be said because they're afraid they might lose their safe seat or lose their position or it may be affecting them in the national executive. My measured success when it was 17 years in the Defense Force as a businessman, being involved in national sports, being involved in management of sports, being involved as a national security advisor, security minister, commissioner of police, as a family member, it is because I want to always make sure there's a team around me, the best team. Every single time I had that measured success, you cannot be successful in life especially in politics. If you're a political leader, and all you want is for people to tell you what you want to hear. My job is, again, and I ask all of you all, please tell me, do I don't want to hear what I want to hear? I want to hear what I need to know. 
and that is important. So that is why, even as a commissioner of police, when you would have seen my measured success as a, a minister of national security, and I heard comments, you know, people continue to link me specifically to national security, not so. The same way we had that success as a minister of national security, it was the highest reduction in serious crime in 31 years. As commissioner of police, it was the highest reduction in violent crime in 17 years. It was because of that team I had around me. So what I intend to do is build Team Trinidad and Tobago and utilizing the National Transformation Alliance as that vehicle towards political success, uniting the country. So when we get into government, I don't want to hear about the PNM is the enemy. When I hear that from individuals, the PNM is the enemy. The individuals who say that, they know nothing about enemy. I know what an enemy is because that same Surrey that I lived in, not this Surrey, that Surrey that I lived in, every time I had to leave to go to go, after I leave a bomb, I had to look under my vehicle because there was a bomb that could be placed on there because I, that was in the days with the Irish Republican Army. I know what an enemy is because as soon as I landed in Trinidad and Tobago after my training in that military academy that actually prepares persons to lead countries, as soon as I arrived, I was the youngest officer to serve in the attempted coup with bullets flying over my head. I know what the enemy is because after spending six months living in a virtual desert in Haiti, trying to fight for democracy and seeing persons killing each other, putting them in a barrel, lighting uh, um, fuel to have them burnt, I know what an enemy is. So when I hear these stupid politicians refer to the other political party as the enemy, you're not helping the country. They are political opponents, they may be incompetent, but they are not the enemy. So my intention is to continue to build Trinidad and Tobago. So you will always have situations of Pekong and trying to make sure the country will understand that certain political parties are weighed, measured, and found wanting. And you would have seen it right here in Lopino. In this area, the good thing that we have seen in local government election is that the NTA decided to go to an area where few political parties outside the PNM decided to go. And we went at that length and breadth in that corridor from Diego Martin all the way to Arima. And that is where, when it is, I intend to speak, to spend time, more time, is on that same lamp model today. People want to know a lamp model. It's not about the light. It is, those are four principles that I have utilized that, have assist, that would have assisted me as a Minister of National Security, as Commissioner of Police. And that lamp model, if we utilize those, that same principle, it will assist us to transform Trinidad and Tobago. So this is not about us and political parties, what they do. They have this manifesto, and we're giving all this glossy paper and show what we intend to do. You're not explaining how you're doing it. You're not giving a timeline. You're not giving a cost. But you put all of these fancy things to try to impress you all, and then for the five years after, you're not going to get it. We have to put an end to the, the situation where politicians give these promises. The main thing with this LAMP model, it starts with L, leadership, leadership. And that leadership, again, we have seen a lack of it in this country. Leadership means being prepared to do what you're asking anyone to do that will be working for you, under you. You have to be prepared to walk the walk. And I certainly did it. In that local government election, I, we had 31 candidates, and we went into the belly of the beast. We went into the 31 hardest seats, or the safest seats that the PNM had. And you know what that was? We did that to prove our worth. We cut deep in roads into a political party that has been a major political party in this country's history. And I was able to walk from moving, starting from Digo Martin, the hills in Paramin, Diamond Vale, Simeon Road, Scorpion and Carnage, Kokorit, going all the way into Laventil, um, in Belmont, Paramin, Silots, Beatum, all through Sawa, um, Sawa Barataria, all through in St. Joseph, Tunapuna, all along here in the hills in Lupino, going all the way up to in the hills in Arima, Tunapuna, every length and breadth of San Fernando, San Grande. No political leader in the history of Trinidad and Tobago can do this. And it's not about Gary Griffith. This is about if you are not prepared to do what you do is under your command or under your control or under your authority will do, but then you're not a leader. And that is the problem in this country. Leadership is not you sitting down and then just waiting to turn up and go on a political platform. 
So when I walk the length and breadth of Trinidad, walking with those candidates belonging to the NDA and another political, another political party, it wasn't just because I got benefit by losing 25 pounds. I'm looking forward to election again to lose another 25. But it was to make sure that I would be able to make those persons who are candidates understand that I am there with you. I am there for you. That is leadership. And that is what has been lacking in this country. Leadership is not you being a dictator, telling persons what to do, attacking individuals, coming down on individuals. And you sit in cabinet and everybody stays quiet, says nothing, and then want to contact me, boy, Gary, I don't know why this man doing this. No, have the strength. So when we get in government, that is what I intend to do. I do not want yes people around me. Tell me if we are doing something wrong. And again, lack of leadership shows again. When you see a minister of national security on a podium and the sun is blazing and persons are on a parade and this man has another fire officer with holding an umbrella because he does not want to have his son affect him. That is lack of leadership. Because you have all of those persons out there boiling and you're saying to yourself, nope, I need to, have, I need to have an umbrella. That is the type of leadership we intend to have. We intend to also ensure that there will be proper accountability. That has been totally lost in the public service. And the reason why I, could, I will just simply shift now and then to the Trinidad Tobago Police Service it is to show to the country that the same way we, and I say we as a team that I had around me, where we were able to transform the Trinidad Tobago Police Service, we intend to transform every single arm and element of the public service in the same manner. And as I said, that is where, because the public service, they've lost that system of accountability. Nobody could be accountable. So everyone will pass the buck. And you would have seen it even as it goes to, to national security. The Prime Minister recently, he will blame law enforcement officials for crime. They blame the parents. They blame society. They blame the judiciary. Every single person, it is a mini vanilla political party, the PNM. You ever know, blame it on the rain? That is what they do. Everything they do, they have to put the blame on somebody else. It is a lack of accountability. And because of that is why the country continues to fail. So the reason why I said I speak from a Trinidad Tobago Police Service perspective is because that budget that I had is a budget that was more than almost every ministry, in, of every minister in this country. So we were able to balance that budget and utilize that to make sure the police could be accountable. And accountability, I'll give you a simple example, absenteeism. When you can recall that uh, or in 20, Carnival 2021, it was the safest carnival ever. There was a 99.8% police attendance because I made sure each and every one was accountable. So those eight, 9,000 police officers, we had 130 that were absent. I met every single one of them to justify why were you absent. That stopped and it went back to 60, 70% in this carnival. And then they have the audacity to say, oh, no, um, um, it was a good turnout. Because there's no accountability. Accountability is what has caused a serious problem with crime. Because most police officers before me as commissioner will not even go to court. So the criminals will be aware that if it is that that I am apprehended, I'm arrested, I'm charged. By the time I get to court, he would not be there. We had to reduce absenteeism by 83 to 91% in every single division by making sure they would be accountable and there would be consequences. And that is where we have to ensure that accountability. And it goes back to how we intend to run a government. Each and every cent must be accounted for. It cannot be a government that is just throwing in a cabinet note every Thursday from different ministries and I know the big thing with, with governments in this country, if we all are not aware, is what governments love to do. The most important day for a government is the Friday before a general election. That Friday is when hundreds of millions of dollars in contracts are approved through cabinet notes in a quick way. Why do you think? Because they don't want to fix the country. That has to stop. If we do that and we look to make sure there's accountability for every single cent spent, there's no need for us to get into that property tax. So when there's that concern about letters, there's important, we must put that property tax. Let me tell you something, Jamaica recently, Jamaica in their first two months in this fiscal, this calendar year, they just made in tourism alone, in their first two months, almost as much as Trinidad and Tobago's whole budget for 2023-2024. For One billion US Jamaica made in tourism in the first two months of this year. And that, is, and that is just one ministry. I don't even think we have a ministry of tourism anymore. So that is the concern that we have because there's no accountability 
And then when you go back to just 2000, we had a prime minister and a government, and that man was accountable. He made sure he was checking every single cent. So he had a US, the, the barrel, the oil barrel, the US was about, that's about $22 at that time, and it was lower. But I'm speaking about 2000. And the budget was 15, 16 billion. But because we have now put ourselves in a system of recurrent expenditure that we cannot get out of with wastage, and that is the point about making sure we have proper accountability. Take away the wastage, make sure that persons are accountable for the positions that they hold. And then when you go into management, Management is the be all and end all for success in any business, any sporting team, any government, any country. And when you have that management, we're speaking about structures, we're speaking about systems, we're speaking about timeline, mission, goals, delivering, cutting the waste, and how to minimize corruption through proper management. Without management, it allows the window of opportunity for incompetence and corruption. And I can give you a simple example, state boards. How could we, coming into the second quarter of the 21st century, run a country where persons are appointed in state boards with your only criteria being the party card that you hold. Our state boards have nothing to stipulate that because you're in this, ministry, this state board under tourism or under whatever ministry, you must have a minimum qualification. So you put square pegs in wrong holes, you then put all of these individuals with the same party card that sets the tone for one thing, incompetence, mismanagement, and corruption. And we could save several billion dollars right there. And that is where the importance of management will come in. And again, going back to the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, if you feel that I'm exaggerating, the first thing I did, because I realized Colin Imbert, um, he decided to cut the um, budget for the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service out of just ignorance. And that was a time when the police service needed it. And I realized what I had to do is look at all of the wastage that the police service has been going through. And then when I checked, over 200 odd police officers were working 24 hours a day, 30 days a month. So they were making, instead of 10, 12,000, they were making $70,000 a month. This was signed by senior officers, so you know what was going on. I was, by putting an end to that and micromanaging, doing my work, which, by the way, working 20 hours a day, seven days a week, sent me into the hospital, and in total contrast to the Calypso student who sang that it wasn't the fault of Nicole Diagrafit, she was taking good care of me, is because I just went into, into burnout. And by doing that, we were able to cut over $300 million in overtime corruption. We, we found the same thing with certain police vehicles were being refueled and filled four times a day. We saw extra, extra duty of police officers putting themselves and claiming they were working extra duty when they were not. So we were speaking about cutting. When you look at that, in a, we were talking about billions of dollars being saved. That is how we can transform a country. That's how we can transform the economy, by making sure we can put systems now to pro, um, ensure proper management. And finally, measuring performance. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, what we did was to make sure we measure their performance, make sure that sometimes provided to be competitive, give them targets, and not targets that cannot be attained. So when a, minute, a commissioner of police will give a target that can't be maintained and you, uh, attained and you fail, it, demor it can demoralize a unit. All your goals must be attainable. And with that, measuring performance, made sure we put systems to make sure there was accountability, making sure there was proper leadership and true good management. And using that same system, we put GPS tracking on the police vehicles. So a police vehicle parked up at the corner of A and B Street, we'll say, why you parked up there for the, last, for the last five hours? You're on patrol now, you need to move. We'll make sure if a vehicle is going too fast and we realize on the system, we realize why are you going 90 kilometers an hour and we haven't sent you out on, a, um, on a, um, an operation. It means that you're breaking the speed limit for no reason. When it is that we can now set you to make sure you get to a location. If you get there in less than five minutes and you were supposed to be just two minutes away, we realize you didn't adhere to it. You, will now, you can now measure your performance and make you accountable. So the same way, the police service, which was seen as the most distrusted, it was not trusted, at, and the public trust and confidence was low, we were to transform that to 59%, which was the highest in public trust and confidence in any arm of the public service. And we can do the same thing for every single, um, as I said, in the public service using these principles. So as I said, I'm sorry for persons who are here and, and to the many who are listening to us the live stream. 
that this political party is one of delivering. We are one of trying to find solutions. We are one, we're trying to make sure we solve the problems, not dividing. I am not a political leader, as others will do. They will speak to the, to the communication unit, start to attack this one on social media, start to do this. Start, that is what you gain by doing that. And who the cap fits, let them wear it. They know who I'm speaking about. That gutter politics must end. And with this government, because of this system that we have, without proper leadership, no accountability, poor management, and no measurement of performance, is where we have a system where an individual, you can have a minister in the National Security Council given authorization to the police to leave the country to kidnap or abduct, you call it, a citizen of this country. And nothing is done because the police officers are all, they, I know them and they're speaking to me on it. They are afraid because they are being directed by the politicians who can bypass them, ignore them, or reward them. So it is a fact that I could tell you that no police officer could leave this country unless they, get, they are given authorization by, the, by a senior member of the National Security Council. So if, for example, the, even the Defense Force hockey team or football team needs to leave the country, the Minister of National Security must approve it. So you think any police officers, those officers could have left here to go to abduct Brent Thomas in Barbados without the approval of the politician? But it is not being investigated because that politician could very well now be charged for aiding and abetting an abduction. And that is because we have no, there's no measurement of performance. That is why a prime minister could immediately shut down our main intelligence agency based on information. Now, he said it based on information. Fire director of security of SSA because of information. So the threshold as it pertains to confidentiality of documents, it is information, intelligence, and evidence. Information is the lowest threshold because that is hearsay, it is rumor, it is, it is vague, it is rough. Then when you get enough and you build it, it is intelligence. It becomes something so of substance now that we can now use for a proper investigation towards evidence and then charging. But you decide to fire a director of the SSC and several others based on information. But when there's a government minister sitting and there was damning intelligence report, you are the same prime minister said, I am not firing him because intelligence is not evidence. That is not democracy, Trinidad and Tobago. That is not democracy, NTA supporters. That is hypocrisy. Because what he's saying is that if it happens to my people in my cabinet, I will turn a blind eye because it is not evidence. And he did it, and I'm not calling the, the person's name. You all know. And when you do that, but then with the director of the SSA, you decide to fire them. And up to now, remember, everything is, it is, it is perceived, it is alleged. That is what they do. It is only in a banana republic that a politician could take a fake report typed up with 17 typographical errors that everyone will know it was it is something that was typed use that and he is still voted as a prime minister the man misled the country and he went into parliament which is the one place that you can lie and mislead a country without being sued and he's voting in as prime minister this is the only country where a president refused to adhere to the law and no investigation could take place this is a situation where a whole police service commission resigned in disgust because of the actions of politicians and nobody is concerned. This is a country where you're talking about politicians telling a commissioner of police, take 40 million TT. I am going to put it into your accounts. But Prime Minister, we have, lights, we have light bill to pay. We don't have fuel for the vehicles. The recruits have no food. Forget about that. This 40 million is to hire these persons, make them SRPs to investigate political opponents so that we could see how fast we can have them arrested. What more than dictatorship do we need to understand where our country has gone? And the reason for this is because there's no leadership, there's no accountability, there's no management, and there's no measurement of performance. And the incompetence goes on and on. And what they do, it's a bandwagonist political party that runs this country. Every time when something goes right, which might be the few occasions, they jump on the bandwagon without doing anything to justify it. We had a national football team during World Cup qualifiers. They did not put a cent for the national team. Had they qualified, they would have been jumping on the bandwagon. They don't put a cent for any sporting team. They suffer. We have the only artificial hockey field in the, Carib in the Southern Caribbean, and it has not been touched for three years. If anyone goes to St. James Barracks for three years, 
taxpayer's money paid for it. Hockey, which is our main sport, the last time Trinidad and Tobago ever did so well in any major sport is hockey. If people are not aware that our Hockey Fives team reached the quarterfinals of the World Cup finals, and nobody knows about it, and they had to work and struggle because the government refused to even allow them to, to utilize that field, and they have to pay for it. And a whole sport has ended for three years because they don't want to use it because Gary Griffith built it. We have a situation where you have um, the recent Miss World pageant. They did not put a cent to assist the contestant, but as soon as she reached the top four, they are the first ones at the airport. And it happens all the time. I manage national teams. We suffered, struggled. I had to put six and seven persons to be in a room with two persons. That's supposed to be for two persons. We'll have to drive several hours to shuttle them. When we qualified for the, for the World Cup finals, for that, the women in Indo, they were the first ones there to celebrate. Same thing when we collect gold medals. This is a country where we have persons who are leaders that are trying to utilize and jump on the bandwagon of citizen success without their effort. And again, as I want to re-emphasize, going into this situation with the property tax, persons will say, well, it is necessary. I beg to differ. If I just spoke to you about the situation, even with Jamaica, Jamaica's budget is, I think, just about three quarters of ours, but they may have two times population. We have so our recurring expenditure. It has billions and billions of filtered in corruption, kickback, mismanagement that can be removed. And the same way that I was able to cut several mil hundred million dollars annually in police corruption, we can do the same with every single arm of the public service by cutting it. So by cutting that corruption, that mismanagement, that incompetence, you are now reducing your expenditure, so there's no need to justify trying to increase your income. And that is how you run, you run a country. And the reason I could say this, because again, there's this perception that Gary Griffith is only involved in, in policing. Running that budget of the police service was, was more than probably the vast majority of any minister and any ministry. So if I could have run that police service budget, I could run a country's budget. I would like to, um, I could go on and on, but I want to close here because I'd just like to have questions. And I just want to close putting into this situation with this third party, third constituency talk. It has been going on for so long now. For persons who are not aware, and to all of those here in Lopino, this here is a marginal seat. It is a marginal seat. When it is, you look at all the votes added up from the last election, um, from all the other political parties, the PNM would have been successful by I think just about 2,000. But the three districts in the local government election, thanks to Nicolene and, the, and other candidates, they were able to cut the distance from 1,000 odd to 180. And you multiply that by three. So you're talking about almost those same, that same 2,000 they were able to cut. So it means that this is now a marginal seat, which is why this individual, Marvin Gonzalez, is worried. He will name things after him. But what he does all the time, I've noticed with Marvin Gonzalez, what he does all the time is that he continues to speak based on hearsay, based on something of a rumor. And it is sad, he's not, he's not an actual politician. He speaks based on rumor, based on propaganda. You know, and it reminds me so much of one of my favorite songs, my favorite singers, in that song where I heard it through the grapevine, and that was Marvin Gaye. So I will refer to him as Marvin Gaye Gonzalez. Marvin Gaye Gonzalez specifically for the song. So Marvin Gaye Gonzalez, because he, everything is he heard, he hears it through the grapevine. Marvin Gaye Gonzalez is worried. Marvin Gaye Gonzalez believes that he could come and win this seat. They have done nothing. When I walked up in Lopino, losing the 25 pounds, and there was each and every person, they said that they, the last time they saw a delivery was in 2010 to 2015. And they called the name of the individual who was there to help them. I give you the promise, the same way, one of the main words that I've always used in leadership is something called accessibility. It wasn't by chance that I decided to give the whole country my telephone number. Because if you want to serve, you must make yourself accessible. And I intend to do that. I intend to make myself accessible to ensure that if anybody who is not serving and doing their job, you can contact me. We will deliver, we will do what is required. And again, going, this is why going back now to this third party, 
This so-called third party that is really the bridge constituency, as I said, we went where no other political party will go. When I walked the length and breadth of Lupino, they never saw a political leader here before. And I will continue to do so. So when you speak about this, this so-called third party that people try to cry down, this third party, that bridge constituency, we have proven it. We went into the belly of the beast and we served and we will deliver. And someone sent a, a note um, recently and they said that this, um, this, this persons in these third parties, the reason why it is we are known as a smaller party is because we don't understand representation. Well, let me just tell that guy something. Because I was in the UNC and I went up in 2006 as a rookie. And I won my seat against Basio Pandey, Kamala Prasad, Bissessa, um, and, and all the others because I was on Dukaran slate. And they selected three persons, myself, Sadiq Bash and, Bash and Manohar Ramsaran, 12 to 3. Because that same UNC said, we saw you as good representation. So how is it I was okay and, and was, I was accepted then, but because now I'm in another party, I'm not represented. And the hypocrisy of those comments is because Kamala Prasad, Bissessa, was in the same third party once, known as the NAR where they got 127,000 votes. So are you saying that she didn't understand representation, but when she came across to the UNC as good representation? It makes no sense. In fact, what you all have done is you all just don't want to... I could easily jump into one of those two parties and be the blue eye boy, which is what I was until somebody decided to whisper lies to the Prime Minister to bust my truth because he was a little jealous of what was happening. And that's the cut and trust of politics. But the point being is that what we are doing, we are not jumping into a party that already will always have 150,000 supporters because that is a base. It is solidified. What you all are doing, and I wish to thank each and every one of you all, you all are doing what is required. That bridge constituency is that independent voter. Those, that person who will think PNM this time, UNC this time, or a third party. They are not a PNM till I die or a UNC till I die. And there's nothing wrong with it. If you believe that you want to vote for a political party till you die because that is our lodge, it makes no sense. How does that help you? How does that make it easier to prevent the possibility of your wife being murdered, your daughter being raped, your son being kidnapped? You don't blindly support a political party. Listen to the plans, listen to the policies, listen to the political will. And that is what is important. If you blindly support something, do like me. Support Manchester United and suffer for 10 years. But don't support a political party blindly. Look at what they have, what they can deliver. So what you all have done, you all have now stepped out to say, I am prepared to support and lead and serve that bridge constituency. And that bridge constituency, let me tell you, those individuals, they are very sensitive lot. They, they look, they analyze, and if you criticize them, if you bad talk them, if you undermine them, what they will do is say, uh-huh, I will show you how important my power is. And you know what that power is? that vote. So for persons who want to continue to undermine and discredit us, understand that the catalyst for every single election is what you all do. Because the 150,000 both sides will always vote that way. And that is their right. But what you do, if you decide to go down the center and say we are not going left or right, you're going to get a result of 1981, 1991, 2000, and 2007. And if you feel you want to measure this, the size of that political party, one political party in 2001, this man had a, a, a candidate in Tunapuna that got 180 votes. 180. And that caused the PNM to win that seat by less than 300 votes and caused Patrick Manning to be prime minister. If it is that you recognize that bridge constituency, you respect them, then you will get a result of 1986, 1995, and 2010. So you decide. So as I close, I wish to thank you all for stepping up as true patriots of this country to be prepared to lead and to serve that third constituency. I thank you. Thank you, political leader, for that clear explanation on the bridge constituency and the LAMP model. You heard it here. L A M M P. LAMP. Leadership, accountability. So we heard it here. 
I'm just saying it again so we know. And, and, and repeating it lets us know what it is, the LAMP model. And the reason why I'm repeating it for you all to hear tonight is that these are the four pillars that underpin the National Transformation Alliance way forward. These are the pillars that form the basis of our journey to transformation. These are the pillars that will guide our strategies and policies on this journey. So I invite all of you tonight to join with me, join with this leadership team, join with our political leader, Captain Gary Griffith, and most importantly, join with the National Transformation Alliance on our journey to transformation. So I'd like to now pass the mic on. We're on the meat of the matter. We would like to hear from you, the villagers, the people, on what are your concerns. The floor is open. Thank you. So if anyone has any questions, you could probably raise your hand. I'll bring the mic over to you. If you don't want to speak on the mic, I will convey the question as well. All right, we have a lot of people up here. Nice. Good evening, everyone. Our political leader, good evening, Gary. I would just like to know, as I believe in your philosophy of a bridging political party, how are we going to bridge? Yes, we can gather the hundreds of thousands of people, which is set, which is, does not belong to the PNM or the UNC. I don't really know how to use it too well. However, <laughs> however, how are we going to use our bridging at the end? Are you going to do it at the end to join to win? Or are, how are we going to use the bridge? Sure. My concern. Yeah, uh, thanks. Yeah. Um, and you can see me from here, Errol? Okay. It, ha it starts now. We cannot be cosmetic. And I think that is what caused the problem in 2010. It was cosmetic. Everybody turned up in Faisabad. They signed something, and then that was known as a Faisabad Accord. A piece of paper signed by five political leaders. That cannot be the way to govern a country. That can't be the way to serve a country. So if it is that we intend to be a bridge constituency, bridge constituency is not one where all of us are just going to join together and come under the umbrella of another political party. I continue to hear that. Come under the umbrella of us. And if you're not with us, you're against us. Really? Really? So who made you king? The fact of the matter is that we must respect the large, larger political parties, yes. But there must be mutual respect. And in that manner, I can say the same thing. If you're not supporting the NTA, then, then you're voting, then you're supporting the PNM. We can't be going down that road, which is where we have to be different. We have to lift our standard and lift the level of politics in Trinidad and Tobago that has never been seen before. And, that, and if we do that, the bridge constituency would be a very massive bridge. It would be a strong bridge. It, is, it cannot be a bridge, you know, those, those temporary bridges that will collapse after a few years. That's what happened in 1986 with the NAR. It is what happened in 2010 with the People's Partnership. The bridge was not one that was built on trust, on mutual respect, on understanding. Because the individuals who come here, and let me again reemphasize, I have the world of respect for PNM and the UNC. They have done a lot to serve and to help this country. They have, people have made mistakes. It, this really and truly has been the most incompetent government in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. But the fact of the matter is that whereas those individuals, those groups, those parties, may have, they, there are a lot of persons came out of there to assist. That bridge, this bridge constituency, you have seen so many great leaders, great servants in this bridge constituency. Don't knock us because we have the capability to continue to build. In 1981, it was 91,000. They got no votes, okay? In 1991, it was 127,000, which included the political leader of the present UNC. So that shows that they could understand that people can shift when they want. They got no votes. In 2007, it became 147,000. And then, and again, no votes. So from 2007, no seats, sorry, no seats. And in 2007, now, you're speaking about persons between the ages of 18 to 35 that never had that, that other choice. And then you have persons who may be totally frustrated with either of the two major political parties. And that is their right. 
to cry them down, to call them the enemy, to say that if it is that you're not with us under our umbrella, under our roof, under our banner, under our symbol, then you are the enemy and it means you're working for the PNM. Do not undermine our intelligence and question it. We are fully aware of what we, have, of what we are and what we can achieve. So that is where the bridge constituency lies. Making sure that we have a proper foundation this time around to be respected and to be not a silent partner in a government, but to play a very strategic part to prevent the mistakes that would have taken place in 2010 to 2015. Good night, good night, residents of Lupino. Good night, good night, political leader and the head table. I would just like to add to a point that you made early on with tourism. Why can't a government spend 20, 30 million dollars in Lupino? Why can't you develop the cocoa, the coffee industry? Why? Why can't the Lupino have the best? We live in the greatest country in the world, if you ask me. Why can't we have investment in all the beautiful areas of our country? Why can't we have a hub in Port of Spain where you could go and pick up a maxi and say we're going to Lopino, a shuttle service, we're going to Sandy Grandi, we're going to Caranaj. Why can't there be a hub that any citizen could go down to Port of Spain or Arima and say I am going on a tour in my beautiful country why can't we have game wardens? Why can't we have a proper facility by waterfalls with safety and security so we, the citizens, can enjoy and enhance and support our local treasures? And this is my concern, and I would like to see also, as we go down that road, I would like to see schools, proper schools built in every community, equal, equal um, affordability, equal um, type of teaching, I would like to see that throughout the length and breadth of the country. And lastly, I would like to see a cabinet meeting held in Lupino and all areas moving forward so every member could visit all areas and see and keep check of all communities in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. I don't know if that was a question or a comment, but just to clarify again, going back to my my initial statement as it pertains to accountability. The budget continues to increase every single year over the last 10, 15 years. And it is because of that recurring expenditure of waste, incompetence, and mismanagement. So that is the reason why those things can't take place. Because we are now boxed into something of recurring expenditure that we cannot get out of. Because that is important to justify. Again, look at a simple example. Only in a banana republic could a prime minister state, and I'm putting a hundred million dollars to bring in retirees from the defense force. You haven't given a timeline, you haven't given a mission, you haven't stated how you're going to do it. Why a hundred million? Why not 99 million, 260,000? Why not 101 million? And that is what we have to go through. So we have to find a hundred, that same hundred million, again, he's going to give it to, to retirees of the defense force to play cards and all fours with persons on the ground. Instead, and whilst at the same time, the police, if you go to Taruka, the police station in Aruka, they, they cut the electricity on them two nights ago. Two nights ago, you cut the electricity, but you're talking about $100 million to give to retirees of the defense force to play all fours with community leaders. Community leaders. That is the problem. And if it is, we find a way, the same way I did it with the police service, I intend to do it with, as I said, every arm in the public service. You do that. We do that, and we cut that wastage, that incompetence, that, that corruption, that 10, 15 billion annually. We can now do so many things that you just spoke about and more. And it's simple things. Instead of saying that, you, that persons cannot use a hose, you could take all, everyone could take their hose and turn it on for the whole night. And that is a small percentage of the wastage we have with the leaks all over the country. And Marvin Gay Gonzalez has not once formed a system the same way I said, if you have a concern of crime, call me directly. And look how simple it is. You give a hotline. Anybody sees a leak anywhere, any pipe, anywhere, you'll inform them and there's an immediate team to immediately rectify it. But you go back to the same old school, um, cut off your hose, nobody could use their hose. Because there's, there's a template, a template of incompetence rather than trying to find a way to get the job done. And that is what we intend to do. Find solutions and not go to the old template. When we do that, 
all of the things we spoke about, Russell, we'll be able to achieve and more. Which is why, again, as I just said, Jamaica in their first two months, one ministry alone was able to bring in income that almost equates with Trinidad and Tobago's annual budget. And that says a lot. Is it that Jamaican ministers are better? No. It's because this government is incompetent and the only way they know how to balance a budget is by taxing the life out of citizens. They do not know how to reduce expenditure whilst, whilst not affecting productivity. We can do it. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, anyone has any other questions here? We have a lot of questions online as well. Oh, okay. All right, we'll take this one. Good night, everyone. Good night at the head table. Welcome to the serene beauty of this Surrey village. We welcome you, the NTA, for being here. Um, my question is, well, property taxes on my head, definitely. That is a... I basically, personally, my life, I spend all my earnings on my house. All. I ain't buy a plane ticket to go nowhere. All. In 2009, I paid my $10. Every year before that, we paid with $10. You're not expecting that you have to pay thousands and thousands. That is my house there. When they come and they tell me about rental, what is my problem? I, not, I didn't build my house to rent. I never build my house to rent. I make comfort for my family. So I'm not paying that. And I'll go to the Privy Council too. I am not paying no property tax. If it's reasonable, I will pay. Other than that, I'm not paying. Um, I, I, I don't know what's the NTA take on that. Are we going to have to go to the Privy Council? <laughs> no. no, well again, as I mentioned, again, to clarify, the NTA cannot be part of a government as being silent partners because you say, well, you're the smaller party. It, the NTA must have a say in government. And that is all that we are pushing for. This is not in any way for us to be arrogant, but we need to understand that we may be a smaller partner, but we must have a say. And by us having a say, it's things like that. I will be able to rectify. We will be able to rectify. Because as I mentioned, when that budget keeps going up, 55, 60, 65 billion, and it will keep going up, it is because they need to find a way to go and try to uh, deal with that feeding frenzy and the corruption and the mismanagement they're trying to balance. So Colin Imsbert, his only way of him trying to understand how to balance a budget is not by reducing expenditure through wastage, incompetence, mismanagement, but try to lift the income. And the only way he could lift the income is not by trying to find a way to diversify the economy, which again, I showed the, the, the example of Jamaica. Two months, two months, one ministry could make almost the whole budget of Trinidad and Tobago. And that is an island in the Caribbean with Trinidad and Tobago. That is the type of leadership we need. If you do that, there's no need for property tax. They are trying to justify property tax because now they have, their expenditure is so high, they need to find a way to get extra income. And that is all the PNM know. The only way they could balance a budget is by taxing citizens. They will find every single tax. And that has to stop. You're going you're gonna to continue to have taxes on fuel. You will have weave tax just now. You're going to have tax on every single thing that is possible. Because that is the only thing they know to do. And we are going to show the difference that we are going to find a way to reduce the expenditure whilst not affecting productivity. And, and let me give you a simple example. What governments have done for decades, again, the, the ministries that governments love is the Ministry of Works and Transport, the Ministry of Public Utilities. That's where a simple contract for a $50,000 box train or whatever, you'll give the person for $500,000. Because what you do, you have all the contractors and everybody, they tender. And all three of us, we are the three, ten, we are the three persons, you will do it for, for 100 million, you do it for 120, I'll do it for 150. But it's really 50 and you, you take it this time around. We have, the country has now lost 50, 60 million dollars because there's been an agreement with a massive markup. The Trent Tobago Police Service, when you listen to the stupidity of Keith Rowley, when he was concerned that I closed Blanchisher Station, apart from the fact that he's a liar, the thing that politicians love is to cut ribbons. So you build a station in Tobago, and the size of the station in, in Tobago can hold every single police officer in Tobago at the same time, over 250. 
And that shows the aim. That shows oh, why would you build that? You all go to New York. Well, I know you don't travel. But anybody else who goes to New York, who goes to Miami, when last have you seen a police station? The days of people going to police stations, it's over. But this government, we love to build police stations 10 times the size, five times the price, so you could get the markup, so it could go back into the pockets of the same politicians. And that is why it is when I put the online report in, the police app, the SOS, the 42 Gary, is to prevent you from having to go to a police station. But because you shut down and dismantle all of this, the same citizens now are now forced to go back to the same police station to hear the lady, well, you don't know where St. James Police Station is? That is what you have to encounter. And there's no need to do that. People do not go to police stations. If you don't go to a police station, we have now saved hundreds upon hundreds of millions of dollars per annum to maintain all of these police stations. We have 110 buildings in police in this country for 7,000 police officers for 1.4 million people. New York City, the NYPD, has 70-odd police stations to deal with 35 to 7 million um, persons with 35,000 police officers daily. It shows the incompetence. So when you reduce that, and instead of, again, as I mentioned, having a situation with, with a tender process like that with everybody doing a markup, you do something called reverse auctioning. And reverse auctioning is one that, okay, we want to build this building. All of you all stand up. <clears throat> I say 20 million. You say 20. Who says 19? Who says 17? That is how you stop the corruption. That is how you minimize the mismanagement. When you reduce that, there's no need now to increase your income because your expenditure starts to go down. When your expenditure goes down, there's no need for property tax. That is how we intend to solve it. And, and next question. Um, you say there's a piece of market for NTA. Do you have an idea of 41, how much you would be contesting? Well, if things continue to go as is 41, I can tell you that. Well, I know you did say that yeah. previously. Because if you're not with us, then you're against us. And as much as I have respect for the previous political leaders of the Congress of the People, the ONR and the NAR, I am not Winston Dukaran, I am not Prakash Ramada. I am going to stand firm and defend the rights of those persons in that British constituency. So if you're not with the NTA, as somebody said recently, if you're not with the NTA, then you're supporting the PNM. If you're not respecting us and you're not giving us mutual respect and you're going to spend all your time on a platform attacking us, undermining us, devaluing us, the NTA will be going up for 41 seats. Yeah, baby! You know it's all about NTA! Here we go! Somebody say NTA! NTA! 